Heavenly Father, Almighty Creator, the time has come for us to take what we have learned, practiced, and lived one step further. God, you have been looking for us so long, and we thank you for your persistence. The love that you have shown us is undeniably the greatest love we will ever experience. No matter what struggles we have or how far away we wander, there you are, standing with your arms wide open, ready to embrace us. God, here we are, ready for you. Take us in your arms and let your heart, our hearts be softened by the words that you speak to us. May we live by and through the light that you provide for us. May you be the one we seek, God. Nothing and no one else but you. Always knowing that, God, you are irreplaceable. So we praise you this morning, God. Knowing the journey that we have led this far has brought us to this very moment, this very service for you. Let us be willing to step outside our darkness and into your light as we recommit to you, God. Thank you. This morning's scripture comes from John chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Follow along on the screen or in your pew Bible, if you would, please. I am the true vine, and my Father is a gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will become even more fruitful. You are already clean because the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into a fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. That is the scripture for today. Now let us prepare our hearts as Mike comes forward. As you are ready and willing, may we also be ready and willing for the words that you have given our Pastor Mike Morgan this morning, God. Let Pastor Mike be your hands and feet as he helps prepare us for the next step towards you. Let your words be our next step in this life for you, God, knowing that every footprint we leave behind is full of your patience and forgiveness and that every footstep we proceed with is full of your grace and love. God, we lift everything and all things to you. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's been a little bit different than maybe we would have planned. Um, I said at one of the services, well, there's two things that came up that, we, uh, that we're doing today that are a little bit different than normal. One is the ice, and somebody said, Pastor Mike, it's January in Iowa. Ice is not a big surprise to us. So anyway, there's one thing we're doing then that's different from normal, and that is uh, what somebody else mentioned to us. You know, Pastor Mike, usually when we come, the bulletin for this service is like this many lines, and now we've got all this reading uh, to do. Well, I want to tell you, why? It is different. And I will tell you that uh, first, as any of our confirmation servants could tell you, um, John Wesley is the founder of the, of the Methodist movement that became the United Methodist movement. All right? And we are doing Wesley's covenant service today. And the only changes that have been made to it from several hundred years ago is that the language has been updated to the English that we speak today. And it's, this is the way it appears in our United Methodist book of worship. And I will say these things about it, these three things. First, the reason we're doing this is this connects us with our foremothers and our forefathers in the faith. It shows us the kind of commitment that they made with their lives to God and that that kind of commitment is still valid today for us to make as Christians as hum and human beings. Second, I will say to you this. This can be a liturgical event. The end of this service is going to take about seven minutes. 
And in those words of liturgy, there are some power-packed concepts and ideas that should just absolutely warm and set your heart aglow for the Lord. Put it ablaze. Now, since they're not your words, we're going to encourage you to take them home. And you're obviously going to have some free time this afternoon that you can rattle them around in your spirit, read them over again. And even before you sign it, because there's a signature line on this, to really give thought to say, is that the kind of Christian that I can be? And I'll pair that with this. As you are aware from coming to this church, and even, and by the way, our guest today is Dave Crow, our district superintendent. So, hi, Dave, <laughs> my boss. Um, so laugh at all the jokes heartily. <laughs> Amen at appropriate times. But Pastor Keith and I, as you know, and certainly in years gone by, we are not what you would call a high liturgical church. You don't have the thing, reason that shocked you is they're not, you're not used to these prayers so much that ask us to read and you to read and so forth. So if we are going to base an entire service around one, it must really be important to us. And therefore we hope it's important to you and that you'll join into us. So let me tell you how we got here. I pray that the intentions of these words get embedded in your heart. This seems to us to be the natural bringing together of our whole month of January. We have spent, as pastors and your leaders, the entire month of January on covenant and commitment. Let me wind your minds backwards to days when the weather was a little bit better. The first Sunday of the year, you came in here. Remember, there's a big white table here. If you, if you weren't here, I'll explain it to you. There's a big white table here, and our communion stewards, in a very solemn way, as, as Andrew in this service read through some scriptures, came and placed loaves of bread, and then a round one at the top, and it formed the form of a body. And then they put a pall, like you would see at a funeral or a mortician, over the top of it and tucked it in. And, and when you were sitting back far, where some of you are sitting back today, you could very clearly see that in the bread, there was the form of this body. And it was to remind us, in that visual, that Christ is our bread of life. That we live in a broken world. And no matter what we do about it, we, on our own devices, with our own strength and power, cannot fix it. So we use this symbol of Holy Communion. And the symbol of Holy Communion is simple. And that is that God is ultimately, profoundly, unbrokenly committed to your deliverance as a person. And then at the end of that service, we watched as the body itself was broken. And then we went to our communion stations like we always did. And, and we, f we felt it in our hands. And we tasted the sweetness of it in our mouth. And we went away celebrating God's goodness and the pledge that He gave to us in Jesus to be our covenant deliverer. And the next week we came and we celebrated the waters of baptism. And we had um, a talk about how we know that there's no water, in the, no magic in the waters of the baptismal font. The baptism truly celebrates the lineage that we already have. That before we came to baptism and after we go out of baptism, we are Christ's family. We are already part of His lineage and we are simply acknowledging that truth to, to be our, our driving factor and that baptism symbolizes a, a directional sign for us in our life. That God's saving grace has come upon us and our intentions are to live a life of faith. And then, do you remember experiencing the waters? We had water where we normally have our communion station. We had water here and there. And we had the baptismal font up here. And most all of you, came forward and swirled your hand in the water, maybe made the sign of the cross on your wrist or your forehead, some of you put over your whole body. And seven human beings came up on the stage while you were doing that and received the sacrament of baptism. And six of them came that morning not knowing that they were going to be baptized. But the Spirit moved in them in such a way that six adults received the sacrament of baptism in our church by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we all then at the end of those services pledged our lives to live wet as if that baptismal water is just dropping off of us all the time. And last week, and I, I, I wasn't here last week and I so appreciate, Teresa and I so appreciate the prayers you, you gave us when, when Sal, her father, had his stroke and there's a lot of ground to cover with that and we just said, you know, just really covet your prayers and thank you. But I listened to Keith's sermon uh, on the internet on, on my iPod, and I heard this fantastic sermon of uh, your preacher talking from a biblical perspective on how God heals us still today. 
and how God brings us home. And, and, and if, if God, is, God is able to heal us and He's willing to heal us and He desires your consent to heal you and your trust in that healing. And then He gathered you all, Pastor Keith gathered you all in groups and led prayers of healing. And there were men and women across here with oil that were willing to impose the, the, the sign of the cross in oil upon your forehead. And I know handfuls of you at each service came forward and, and, and prayed with Him. All of those things lead till today, towards today, which today is just going to be a simple admonition, a simple leading of you towards an invitation to think deeply and commit with everything that you are and everything you're going to ever be to live in Christ. And so this is going to be really simple. A couple of weeks ago as I was preparing for this talk, I really focused in on John 15, the entire chapter, and, and I was just absolutely drawn to verse 4. So um, I think they're going to put it on the screen, but if not, man, when you go home, go look at John 15, verse 4. It goes like this. Jesus, Jesus is saying these words at the Last Supper. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit by itself if it is severed from the vine. I mean, we know that. I'm not an agronomist, but I do know this, that if you cut off a, vine, a, a branch, it can't grow any more grapes or it can't grow any more apples or whatever it's all about. And you can't be fruitful unless you remain in me. So if the branch can't remain fruitful unless it remains in the vine, we can't remain fruitful unless we remain in Christ. And that's all we're going to talk about today is remain in me, remain in Christ. Make your home in Christ and stay. Because see, here's the thing. Pastor Keith and I have been at this for a little bit. And we could tell you of a lot of stories of human beings who thought they might want to live in Christ, but they couldn't move all the way in. You know, I mean, they shouldered up to Christ. They got close to Christ. They got, they got close to living in Him. I mean, they knew the church. They started wandering around the halls of some church, one that he served or one that, that I served. And they started knowing about God. You know, they would hear the songs and they would, you know, feel the feelings and all that kind of stuff. And they might even know about the Bible. And they came to know about Jesus, but they never got to know Him. They never got to know Him personally. They never made the decision to finally and completely move all the way in. For one reason or another, they didn't move themselves all the way in to Christ. They stayed close to the action, but didn't want to be in it. Now, I've had occasion recently to be on a number of college campuses, and I was at a college campus a few uh, days ago. You know, I had the appropriate name tag so I could walk around, and that actually gives you permission to not be a creeper on the young people on campus. But I was in this setting where there was, you know, five or six young men and women. And, of course, you know, what do old people do when they encounter college students? They ask two questions. What's your major and where are you from, right? So I'm doing that. And this one girl says, uh, I said, where are you from? She says, I'm from Chicago. I said, that's awesome. We love Chicago. My, my wife is from Chicago. We love going down to Michigan Avenue and going all up and down those stores. We, we've been to the American Girl thing. Boys and fathers, if you've got children, don't take your daughters to the American Girl thing. It's just like... <laughs> I mean, you'll, you'll go to Wisconsin Dells to save money after that, okay? That's how bad the American girl thing is, okay? So, I mean, you, you know, I love that place. I love going to eat at Lala's on Ohio and LaSalle. I said, do you love all that stuff? And she says, well, actually, sir, I don't live in Chicago. I live in Antioch. That's about 45 miles from downtown, and 45 minutes from downtown. And we really don't get in there, and I really don't get involved in any of that. And I, we actually don't even go downtown ever. I said, well, you don't live in Chicago then. You live near Chicago, but you don't live in it. You're not part of the action of the city. You're just close by. And so, of course, the simple parallel is this, Christians, is that we can't live in the suburbs of Christianity. We've got to move all the way into Christ, all the way into where all the action is, all the way into to where Christ is, because the temptation is always to live near Christ so we can see Him and feel Him and get some of the good vibe for it but never move all the way in to Him. So I admonish you to move into Christ and have no other home but Christ. Don't have a second home somewhere else. We, Tree and I, before we had children of our own, were asked to do something that, that uh, we were young enough to say yes to. I had been a youth pastor for a handful of years in Colorado Springs, 
And then we moved to western Colorado, about 250, 260 miles away from Colorado Springs. And there were two young boys there when I left. There were many kids, but these two boys were in one family. Their dad had died when they were four. They were twins, and they were rising up to their senior year in high school. And their mom, who was kind of a diminutive lady, was starting to have problems with them. Now, these boys weren't like smoking dope or robbing you know, convenience stores or something like that. They just fought with each other all the time. They could not stop fighting from each other, and they had gotten big enough that the fights had become pretty physical. So physical that Lynette, their mom, had had to call the police several times on them, and she was at their, her wit's end, and she called us one day, very tearfully, at the end of the summer, and said, uh, Mike, Teresa, I want to ask something to you that is a lot. She explained the situation. She says, now we've been able to find Michael somewhere to go live. He's going to live with his uncle in Canada. But we're asking you if you would bring Sean into your house and have him live with you for this school year and to see if you can help him and guide him and shepherd him and, and grow him up. Now I'm just going to tell you, and you can pass this on to your kids, the best way to learn how to be a parent is not to bring a 17-year-old into your home when you're 25. Okay, you learn a lot of things, but I don't know if you learn a lot of things. And we had we had a great experience with Sean. We loved him. There were some bumps. I mean, the reason he was there was because of problems. And we had some bumps along the way. But here's what happened at the end of the year. Graduation came up. We went to the graduation. His mom came over. Didn't have texts and emails. He'd call her once a week or so, usually when we met him. And after all that was over, she pulled a suburban, big suburban into our driveway. We went into his room. We carried all of his stuff, put it in the suburban, and he left with her. See, because he was living with us, but he had another place to live, too. He had another place to live. Now, just, uh, you know, you hear a story like that, you say, how did that guy come out? Well, he's a tenured faculty in the English department at the University of Alabama, so he came out okay. But he had somewhere else to live, you see. He wasn't living completely. He wasn't part of ours. And I have to tell you, Christians, spiritually and emotionally and even physically, we have to make sure that we only have one place to live. And that's in Christ Jesus and nowhere else. George Barner is this guy that writes lots of books about uh, and does a lot of research about church and Christianity in the United States and across the world. Not too long ago, he published a study of, that he and his colleagues had done on Christianity in the American workplace. And this is what he found out. And this is what they did. They, they sent a bunch of, of, of their team of young guys and gals out to research American workplaces, big corporations, and they embedded themselves in the culture. And then they followed people around. And they actually, too, asked people to self-identify you know, themselves as Christians and non-Christians and fill out some surveys about what they did, how they'd react in certain circumstances. And here's what Barna finds. And this should absolutely slow, slay us as Christians. At the end of his study, he wrote this. As I reviewed Christians and non-Christians in the American workplace, as I reviewed their behavior and their interactions with other people, as I reviewed their ethical decisions and their behavior, I can find no discernible difference between Christians and non-Christians in the American workplace. And I ask you, how can this be so? How can this be so when the Christian word has been being preached to us from generation to generation, when we have the scriptures and it tells us to live holy and righteous and beautiful lives, not just in the confines of the church or our home, but to take that into the workplace, and yet thousands of workers exhibit none of this because they have two places to live. They have their home and their Christian life, and they have another life that they go live, another place that they go live at work or at play. And I tell you, don't let that be so for you. Just have one place to live and let that place be in Christ. I, I want to show you a very simple example. I told you I was a youth guy and I still love working with youth all the time. And so sometimes I think a picture is worth a thousand words. Let me show you something. Now, earlier this morning, before it even started to rain, I brewed a bunch of hot water. Don't you love a good cup of hot water in the morning? And I'll tell you this to be true, too, because there are very few people I know that will brew up themselves a, a, a pot of hot water and grab that in the afternoon, you know, when they're starting to, you know, get a little tired and take a drink of that and say, yeah, boy, that hits the spot. Very few people I know drink hot water. A lot of people drink coffee. A lot of people drink tea. But we know this. 
that water is the lifeblood of humanity. You can't survive without water. That's kind of the, the center. You can't be cut off from water. And so let me show you something. I'm not a tea drinker, so I'm going to encourage you not to drink this after I make it, just like I wouldn't drink your coffee if you don't drink coffee. But, you know, if you take a tea bag, and I don't make tea, except for the three times I've already made it today, very often, but you put a tea bag in there, and it doesn't take very long for the water to start changing, does it? You know, a minute ago, it was as clear and clean as Marian water ever gets, you know. And now with just a little bit, just a little bit of coaxing, just a little bit of tea. And I'm not even going to leave it in there very long because you can already see the difference. And I'm not a chemist. Typically, they wouldn't even let me down at that end of the hall in church, in school. But I do know this. Without, like, a very, very expensive machine, which probably one of you guys has in your home, I don't know, it is impossible for us to separate the tea and the water anymore, isn't it? They've become one. You can't pull the tea out of the water. It's part of the water. And you can't pull the water out of the tea. Do you understand? Is this as simple as I can make it? You know, see, if you move all the way into Christ, and you attach himself to to Him fully, your DNA becomes the DNA of Christ. And Christ's DNA becomes your DNA. See, I admonish you not to live close to Jesus. I mean, you know, the whole time I had that water poured, the tea bag was right here. I could have said, well, look, here, let's make tea and try to bang it up next to the side and it would have made, wouldn't have made tea. It had to get all the way in, just like you and I have to move all the way in to Christ and decide there is no other life for me than life in Him. Attach yourself to Him in ways that make clear that you have no other home but His. And Christians, for goodness sake, enjoy it. Don't just act like it's the best thing ever. Know that it's the best thing ever. That you love being attached to Christ and that you want no other life than the life in Christ and that you can't imagine your life any other way. Now, we're going to come in a moment to this this minute of covenant. And this covenant is simple, as we say often, but it's not easy. It's a lot of words. That's not the hard part. But it really focuses around three things. Believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son and He's the Savior of your life. Receive Him into your heart and allow His Spirit to flow through you for He gives value to your life. He has redeemed it. He has washed it clear of any dark spot and spend the rest of your life becoming who God wants you to be for He gives you your life meaning and purpose. And vow to remain continuously connected to Christ. So grab those bulletins and I'm actually going to ask you to stand And since there's opportunities to kneel and forward, and there's only about 50 or 60 of us here, come on down, all of y'all. Come on down, all of y'all. If you want to kneel and sit or whatever, just go ahead, Pastor. sin and consecrated to God. Through baptism, we have entered this life and have been admitted into the new covenant of which Jesus Christ is the mediator. He sealed it with his own blood that it might last forever. On the one side, God promises to give us new life in Christ, the source and perfecter of our faith. On the other side, we are pledged to live no more for ourselves but only for Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. From time to time, we renew our covenant with God, especially when we reaffirm the baptismal covenant and gather at the Lord's table. Today, however, we meet as the generations before us have met to renew the covenant that binds us to God. Let us make this covenant of God our own. Commit yourselves to Christ as his servants. Give yourselves to him, that you may belong to him. Christ has many services to be done. Some are more easy and honorable. Others are more difficult and disgraceful. 
Some are suitable to our inclinations and interests. Others are contrary to both. In some, we may please Christ and please ourselves. But then, there are other works where we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. It is necessary, therefore, that we consider what it means to be a servant of Christ. Let us, therefore, go to Christ and pray. Will you join me in the bold print? Let me be your servant under your command. I will no longer be my own. I will give up myself to your will in all things. Be satisfied that Christ shall give you your place and your work. Lord, make me what you will. I put myself fully into your hands. Let me be put to doing, put to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and with a willing heart give it all to your pleasure and disposal. Christ will be the Savior of none but his servants. He is the source of salvation to all who obey. Christ will have no servants except by consent. Christ will not accept anything except full consent to all he requires. Christ will be all in all or he will be nothing. Confirm this by a holy covenant. To make this covenant a reality in your life, listen to these admonitions. First, set apart some time more than once to be spent before the Lord in seeking earnestly God's special assistance and gracious acceptance of you, in carefully thinking through all the conditions of the covenant, in searching your hearts whether you have already freely given your life to Christ, consider what your sins are. Consider the laws of Christ, how holy, strict, and spiritual they are, and whether you, after having carefully considered them, are willing to choose them all. Be sure you are clear in these matters. See that you do not lie to God. Second, be serious and in a spirit of holy awe and reverence. Third, claim God's covenant. Rely upon God's promise of giving grace and strength so you can keep your promise. Trust not your own strength and power. Fourth, resolve to be faithful. You have given to the Lord your hearts and have opened your mouths to the Lord and you have dedicated yourself to God. With God's power, never go back. And at last, then, be prepared to renew your covenant with the Lord. Fall down on your knees. Lift your hands toward the heaven. Open your hearts to the Lord as we pray. And if you need be, you can see, sit or kneel now. O righteous God, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, see me as I fall down before you. Forgive my unfaithfulness in not having done your will. For you have promised mercy to me if I turn to you with my whole heart. God requires that you shall put away all your idols. I hear from the bottom of my heart, renounce them all, covenanting with you that no known sin shall be allowed in my life. Against your will, I have turned my love toward the world. In your power, I will watch all temptations that will lead me away from you. For my own righteousness is riddled with sin unable to stand before you. Through Christ, God has offered to be your God, again if you would let him. Before all heaven and earth, I here acknowledge you as my Lord and God. I take you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for my portion, and vow to give myself, body and soul, as your servant, to serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of my life. God has given the Lord Jesus Christ as the only way and means of coming to God. Jesus, I do hear on bended knees, accept Christ as the only new and living way, and sincerely join myself in a covenant with Him. O oh, blessed Jesus, I come to you hungry, sinful, miserable, blind, and naked, unworthy even to wash the feet of your servants. I do hear with all my power accept you as my Lord. I renounce my own worthiness and vow that you are the Lord my righteousness. I renounce my own wisdom and take you for my only God. I renounce my own will and take your will as my law. Christ has told you that you must suffer with him. I do here covenant with you, O Christ, to take my lot with you as it may fall. 
Through your grace, I promise that neither life nor death shall part me from you. God has given holy laws as the rules of your life. I do here willingly put my neck under your yoke to carry your burden. All your laws are holy, just, and good. I therefore take them as the rule for my words, thoughts, and actions, promising that I will strive to order my whole life according to your direction and not allow myself to neglect anything I know to be my duty. The Almighty God searches and knows your heart. O God, you know that I make this covenant with you today without guile or reservation. If any falsehood should be in it, guide me and help me set it right. And now, glory be to you, O God the Father whom I, from this day forward, shall look upon as my God and Father. Glory be to you, O God the Son, who have loved me and washed me from my sins in your own blood, and now is my Savior and Redeemer. Glory be to you, O God the Holy Spirit, who by your almighty power have turned my heart from sin to God. O mighty God, the Lord Omnipotent, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have now become my covenant friend, and I, through your infinite grace, have become your covenant servant. So be it. And let the covenant I have made on earth be ratified in heaven. Amen. Now these are the words of our faith. Old words. Words that have been around for a long time. So maybe you want to sign them now, but I really encourage you and admonish you to take them home. Rattle them around in your heart and spirit and commit to that kind of life. God bless you as we move all the way into Christ. This concludes our service. Hug each other, love each other, and go in peace. And be really safe and careful. Not just in the hugging, but in the driving home. <laughs> Good to see you here. And your sky's cousin. Glad you're here. Glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Awesome.